Jerry, I think I'll hand it over to David. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, well, welcome everyone to pre uh, preventing 10 common securities mistakes in the mean stack. Uh, brief introduction, uh, who am I? I'm David Bohannon. I'm a security consultant with Synopsys uh, based out of Atlanta. And I've spent the last year or so working with uh, mean stack applications. Uh, so more specifically, mining vulnerabilities in these uh, technologies, frameworks, and plugins, and then converting those uh, vulnerabilities into triggers for a static analysis engine. So who is this talk intended for? Well, really for both developers and security professionals. And uh, what can you expect from this talk? Well, so I designed the talk with the assumption that the audience has a basic understanding of Mongo, Express, Angular, and Node.js. So that allows us to forego a lot of the basic introduction to these technologies and rather focus on the actual uh, vulnerabilities and, and common mistakes. Now, what makes these common mistakes? Uh, many of them are the result of using these components in their default configuration, uh, or they're simply the result of uh, mistakes that are easily implemented by developers. So uh, I've also created a uh, intentionally vulnerable a mean stack application that we'll use to demonstrate these, uh, these problems, these issues, uh, as well as the solution. So we'll show you not only how to exploit these, these mistakes, but also how to fix them. Uh, we've got 10 different things we're going to talk about in the course of about 40 minutes, so we're going to be moving pretty quickly. Uh, so without any further introduction, hang on, and uh, here we go. So the first part of the technology stack we're going to pick on is MongoDB. So MongoDB is a NoSQL database. So it doesn't use, it doesn't have a concept of a structured query language. And as I'm sure everyone knows, one of the, uh, historically one of the, the big problems with a SQL database is SQL injection. So we have some sort of untrusted input that's appended to our uh, query statement that allows a malicious uh, user to alter that query, drop databases, uh, add rows, things like that. So the question is, does NoSQL mean no injection? Well, the answer is no. Uh, MongoDB has a concept of query selector operators. And these are all uh, operators that start with a dollar sign. Dollar GT uh, means greater than, dollar NE for not equal to, and dollar not for negation. And if an attacker can inject these queries, or these uh, uh, query selector operators into the query, they can alter the, the logic of that query. So, for example, let's look at this, uh, this query, this find one. And essentially what this is doing is, is looking, uh, doing a lookup for a username that matches our variable user and a password that matches our variable pass. So it's part of our th authentication flow. And what happens if the user inputs this? So it's the object where the user is admin and the password is the object not equal to null. Well, the result is we're looking for the password where the username, or the, the entry where the username is admin and the password is the object not equal to null, which is always going to return true, which is going to allow us to authenticate to the application without actually having a valid admin uh, credentials. So this is great, but how do we do it? How do we inject these, uh, these, these nested operators like this? Well, Express helps us out. So if we're using the mean stack, we have our Mongo database. We're also expected to have an Express server. And when Express uh, sees these nested URL encoded parameters in our input, it's going to automatically parse them for us. So what happens is in either our, uh, our, our uh, get URI or our simple post form, the URL encoded um, uh, parameter pass bracket dollar any equals is actually going to be translated to the password is the value of the object dollar ne or not equal to null. So this allows us to again inject our uh, query operators into our uh, find one statement and alter the the logic of this operation. So one way that we can fix this is to simply cast our, our input to a string. So what we end up with is a result that's looking for the username or a query that's looking for the username admin and the password that's the string representation bracket dollar any colon null. So that's one way that we can prevent uh, users from injecting our, our query selectors. Uh, the other option is to simply sanitize uh, our parameters that begin with dollar keys. 
So we can do this manually or we can use uh, one of the, the, the um, uh, off-the-shelf packages that will do this for us, right? So if an attacker tries to inject these uh, query operators, it's going to strip them out for us. So what we're going to do is look at the mean bug application. Uh, if we attempt to log into it with just username admin, password admin, it doesn't work. But what we're going to do is we're actually going to intercept this authentication request using burp suite proxy, and then we're going to change the password value to our payload $NE equals null. And then we're going to forward that request on to the application, and we see that we're able to authenticate without actually providing a valid password. So if we navigate into the application, we see we can also query some invoices and do some other interesting things. So we're going to attempt the same attack here. So what we're going to do is we're going to intercept the request. And if we notice, this is not a simple post form. This is a, uh, a more complex form. It uses a JSON body. So what we're going to do is we're going to change the content type to form URL encoded. And then we're simply going to change our payload to the URL encoded payload containing value any equals null. And what it's going to do is it's going to return all the entries in our database, just like so. So the way we're going to fix this is we're going to go to our authentication uh, find one uh, query, and we're going to cast our user variable to a string, and we're going to cast our password variable to a string so that it's no longer acting as that query operator, but what, uh, query selector operator, but why, rather as a string representation. So we restart our server. And we're going to do the same, uh, same attack as before. So we're going to intercept the request. We're going to submit the request. We're going to alter it. Again, the password dollar any null. And we're going to forward that on to the application. And as you see, now the uh, injection attack no longer works. So again, the, basically for Express to, to parse this out, we need to use a URL encoded uh, payload, either in the GET request or in the simple POST request. But even if we don't have that, we can still change the, uh, the content type and instead change our, our uh, body as well so that we're in, uh, sending that URL encoded request and we're actually able to uh, exploit uh, non-simple post forms as well. So con continuing with, uh, with MongoDB, uh, one of the other issues is insecure configuration. So by default, MongoDB does not have authentication. It's, it's disabled. Uh, there was a CSO online article uh, back in January uh, detailing of how more than 40,000 MongoDB instances were compromised by ransomware because they were publicly exposed to the internet with no authentication. Uh, not a good combination. The Shadow Server project is another interesting project uh, that does periodic queries of the entire uh, IPv4 space looking for MongoDB instances without authentication. And as of uh, just a few days ago, there were still almost 28,000 instances uh, again, publicly exposed with no authentication. So uh, that presents a problem, but it, it gets worse. So if you're using an older version of MongoDB, not only does it have no authentication by default, you're also going to be binding to all interfaces by default. So again, you have uh, an out-of-the-box uh, database server that as soon as you stand it up, it's going to be publicly, list or publicly exposed uh, and have no authentication. Uh, some other configuration issues with MongoDB, uh, they provide the, the option to enable an HTTP and REST interface. Now, these guys aren't enabled by default, but if they have been enabled, it's going to present some uh, information leakage issues. So they're configured in the Etsy MongoDB configuration file, and there's simply two, uh, two options that can be turned on or off. And how do we fix these? Well, first, we need to make sure that we're configuring bind IP to only bind to our necessary interfaces, uh, turn on authentication, and turn off HTTP interface and REST options. So we'll look at uh, an example MongoDB instance that's uh, insecurely configured and show how you know, these uh, poor options can be exploited.
So we're going to navigate to our, our MongoDB instance, and by default, the REST interface is exposed on port 28017. So when you navigate to it, we have these various commands up top that are our REST interfaces, and we can do things like get build information on the database uh, instance, uh, show the databases, And then we can also scroll down and look at the, the various logs for this, uh, this MongoDB instance. Uh, so lots of good information that we can glean as an attacker if we can gain access to this. Again, because uh, authentication is disabled, we can connect directly to our database using the Mongo shell utility and query it directly and get things like uh, user credentials. So how do we fix this? Well, we're going to go to the MongoDB configuration file, and the first thing we're going to do is turn on authentication. Uh, next, if we don't want to bind to all interfaces, then we need to specify which interface we're going to bind to. Um, and then we need to turn off the HTTP interface and REST interface options. So now we're going to restart our, our MongoDB instance. And we're going to connect to it again. And once we connect to it, we're, we see that when we try to do the same find uh, query, we don't get anything. We're, we're unauthorized. And if we try to access the uh, HTTP interface, again, it's not being served uh, anymore. All right, enough with MongoDB. Let's look at Express. Uh, so Express is the, uh, the, the server component of our, our uh, mean stack. And Express is a concept of routes and middleware. Okay, so we can define various routes. We can define uh, various middleware components and apply that middleware to those routes. But our middleware, if it's applied globally, so we're saying, hey, apply this to all the routes in our Express stack, that middleware is only going to be applied to routes that are lower down in our Express stack, so routes that have been defined after that middleware. So this can present a problem if we have uh, sensitive routes that are defined before our, uh, our middleware that performs some sort of uh, security function, right? So we have the middleware is logged in. This is our authentication middleware that checks to see, is this user actually authenticated for this resource that they're requesting? So we have two routes. First is the secure add invoice route. So this lets us add an invoice to our application, and it's defined after this middleware, so it's going to be protected. We have to be authenticated before we can access this. Uh, the other route, remove invoice, is defined before this middleware. So the problem here is even though we're applying this middleware globally, it's being applied after this other route, and it's not actually going to protect it. So the, uh, the remediation here is simply to, to check the order of our routes and our middleware. And where this uh, becomes a more prominent issue is when we're dealing with an older application, something that we're performing maintenance on, adding routes to it. Before we just drop a route into the stack, we have to look at all the other middleware and make sure that we're not uh, defining this route before some sort of middleware that needs to be protecting it. All right, continuing with Express, uh, case-insensitive routing. So by default, Express uses case-insensitive routing, meaning that capital secure managed invoices is going to be the same as lowercase secure managed invoices. Well, this becomes a problem if our middleware is applied uh, based on that route path. So we have our authentication middleware, uh, and we're applying it to all routes that, have, uh, that begin with the path slash secure. But the regex we're using is case insensitive. So it's only looking for routes that begin with slash lowercase secure. And we have in our application, the only route that is defined is slash lowercase secure. Well, this becomes a problem if uh, we're using case insensitive routing, which Express does by default, because capital secure is going to return the same uh, resource, but it's not going to be protected by this middleware. So how do we fix this? Well, we have two options. We can either design our application around these case-insensitive routes. Uh, in this example, we would need to change this regular expression to a case-insensitive regular expression. Or we can tell Express, hey, only use case-sensitive routes. And we can do that by setting the case-sensitive routing option to true, in which case the uh, Express server will no longer uh, return the same resource for uh, capital secure managed invoices as it does for lowercase secure managed invoices. So let's uh, look at an example. If we try to force browse to lowercase secure managed invoices, we see that we're unable to do so. It rejects our request and sends us back to the login screen. However, if we change this to capital secure managed invoices, 
then we can actually force browse to uh, an authenticated page. And again, this is because uh, Express is using those case insensitive routes. So we have two options to fix this. We can either, again, go in and set this regular expression as case insensitive so that it's applying to lowercase secure or uppercase secure, or we can set the case sensitive routing option to true for Express uh, to tell it to use only case sensitive routes. So that's what we're going to do in, in this case. Uh, we're going to restart our server. And we're going to try the same uh, forced browsing attempt again. And you see that this time, it doesn't return the resource. Uh, it says the capital secure managed invoices doesn't exist. All right, continuing with Express, uh, CSERF and Git request. So CSERF is a popular uh, anti-CSERF middleware for Express. Uh, it has 1.2 million downloads as of uh, March, and the link to that package is, is located in the slide. And basically what this, uh, this middleware does is it provides the uh, server-side checking of our uh, anti-CSERF token, right? So it looks uh, for the, the inbound request on the route, it uh, parses out the, the CSERF token and checks to make sure that it's actually a valid request coming from one of our, our pages uh, rather than a CSERF attack. But the problem is if we apply this middleware globally, so we're uh, telling Express to apply it to all routes, it's not going to get applied to uh, any route that uses the get method. So if you look at our example here, it's going to be applied to secure add invoice, but not to secure remove invoice. Again, because the secure remove invoice is using the get method. So how do we fix this? Well, the, the recommended remediation in uh, the, the most appropriate order is first to avoid state changing requests with the get method. So anything that changes state on our, our server, it's, it's generally bad hygiene to, to perform those requests with the get method. So as we can see in the excerpt here, we've simply changed this to a post request, I'm sorry, to a, a post, uh, a route expecting the, the post method. And in this case, it's gonna be properly protected by our CSERF middleware. Uh, the other option is to remove the get method from the ignore methods option. So again, with the CSERF middleware, uh, we can define the ignore methods option as only head and options. We've removed git from that array, and it's going to tell the middleware, no longer ignore the git method. Go ahead and apply yourself to routes that, that use the git method. And the final option is to simply apply our middleware per route rather than globally. So previously, we were applying it to the entire application stack. Well, we can also apply it to each individual route by manually uh, inserting into that route definition. Now, this is the least recommended option, uh, primarily because it increases the likelihood that a developer is going to forget to include it on a sensitive route. But it is a viable option. So we'll look at an example. Uh, again, we're logged into our, our Meanbug application, and we see that we can uh, uh, navigate over to the, the invoice page. And if we look at our, our database of invoices, we see that it contains two invoices, uh, ID 3 and ID 4. So what we're going to do is click on this link. This is, represents a malicious link sent to us by an attacker that calls, uh, sends a request to the remove invoice route for ID 000004. And so by simply clicking on that link, we've deleted that invoice. If we go back and look at the database queried again, we see that number four has been removed, only three remain. So that's a prime example of our, uh, our CSERF attack. How do we fix it? Well, we can change that get request to a post request, or a post route, or we can go to the CSERF uh, middleware definition here and change the ignore options method to only include head and options. So. That's what we've done in this case. We've told the middleware, hey, apply yourself to the Git routes as well. We've restarted our server, and now we'll, we'll uh, perform the same attack again. So we'll create a new uh, URL. Again, it's going to our uh, mean bug application for move invoice with the value. Uh, this time we'll use 000003, and we'll simulate the attack again. So we'll, when we click on that link, Instead of removing the actual invoice, we see we get a form tampered with message. So 
our CSERF uh, protection is now being applied to that route appropriately. And if we look at the database of our invoices, we see that our invoice is still there. So we've prevented that cross-site request forgery attack. All right, continuing with Express, uh, session revocation and JWTs. So uh, JWTs or JSON web tokens are uh, becoming more and more popular uh, as a mean to, to store our, our user's session data client side. So the way this works, the data, data is digitally signed. Our, our JWT has a header, it has our body, which has the actual data for that user's session, and then it has a signature. So the signature is what validates that this uh, JWT hasn't been tampered with. And that signature is going to be checked server side to make sure that, again, that uh, no tampering has occurred. So the, the big uh, advantage here is our server no longer needs to maintain session state data server side. We can push that over to the client, right? And because this JWT is signed, we can uh, have a level of assurance that this, this JWT hasn't actually been tampered with. But this also means that the application cannot revoke our session. So even if we set the expired Zen or max age attribute on the session cookie, all we're doing is requesting that the browser purge the session after that set amount of time. We're not actually invalidating the session. So if all we're relying on is expired Zen or max age, this session will last forever. It can be replayed indefinitely uh, days, weeks, months down the road, and the server doesn't know any better. So the other problem here is the user can't log out of their session. So if the user programmatically logs out of our application, all it's going to do is simply uh, redirect them to the login page. It could potentially purge the, uh, the session from the browser, but that session is, is still going to be valid. If it's been captured, it can be replayed even though our user has, quote, logged out. So how do we fix this? Well, our JWTs have to maintain an internal expiration value. So what that means is inside that body of our JWT, remember that data is signed, it can't be tampered with, we have to maintain an expiration value that the server will check to see if this JWT is still valid or if it's been expired. Uh, one package that's, that's fairly common that does this for us is client sessions. Uh, again, we can use this off-the-shelf package to implement this functionality for us in our Express stack. Um, another consideration is generally we want to make this uh, JWT session time a little bit shorter than what we would use with conventional sessions. And again, that's because our user can't log out of a session that's, that's persisted with uh, JWTs. So the only way that session is going to actually be terminated is for that internal uh, value to expire. So again, this is using the client sessions package. Uh, it has this internal duration option where we can set that internal duration of this JWT. And also this max age where we can set the max age of the cookie. From a security perspective, the max age doesn't mean anything. Because again, we're just requesting that the browser purge that session. Uh, it's not actually invalidating it. So the duration is what we're, we're really concerned about when we're looking at this. All right, so uh, to demonstrate this, We've authenticated to our application, we've logged into our session, and this first value is the time that our JWT uh, session token was created, and that uh, second value is how long it's going to be valid. And th these are in milliseconds. So we're going to log out of the application, and we see we're redirected to the login page. And if we look at our session, the session has been uh, purged from our, our, our browser. It's uh, now set to null. But if we go into our HTTP proxy, we've captured the session value, the JWT, we can replay it and it's still going to be valid. Right? It's going to continue to be valid until that internal uh, expiration time expires. So JWTs, they're, they're cool, but they have some, uh, some interesting quirks from a security perspective that you know, we need to be aware of. All right, so enough with Express. Next, we're going to talk about Angular. Uh, specifically expression injection. So Angular templates are defined by our ng app directive, which is bound to our uh, body HTML element in, in this example. And then the expressions are denoted by our double curly braces. Uh, in this case, uh, the double curly braces are uh, calling the, the variable user. So 
one of the problems or the causes of, of our angular expression injection is curly braces are not encoded by off-the-shelf HTML encoding solutions. So what that means is even if we're encoding our untrusted input for use within an HTML context, our angular expression injection may still be possible because we're not actually encoding those curly braces. And those curly braces are the control characters that are used to denote, denote our angular expression. So uh, injecting curly braces also means an attacker can evaluate uh, arbitrary expressions. And expressions are not sandboxed as of Angular 1.6. So what that means is uh, we're not confined to the, the Angular scope object. We can access other, uh, uh, basically anything that, that we'd like uh, by not having to worry about that sandbox. And even if we're using an older version, sandbox es uh, escaping payloads still exist for previous versions. So what does this look like? So our malicious Angular uh, code is injected through our untrusted input. Uh, even if we're passing it through some sort of uh, HTML encoding solution, uh, only our HTML special characters are encoded. So our Angular curly braces are not going to be encoded. And they're going to be written to our Angular template. Our Angular template is then passed over to our Angular uh, expression engine, which is going to render those expressions, including our malicious code that has been inserted by our attacker, and then it's going to execute within the view. Now, this can all occur client side, or it can occur server side if we're using things like um, like Jade, EJS, Pug, some of the server side templates uh, to create our Angular template and then sending it to the client, like so. So how do we fix this? Well, one of the options is to reduce the scope of the ng-app directive. So instead of binding to the body, uh, we can bind to a specific div or table element or some sort of uh, element that uh, has a smaller scope. And if we're not writing untrusted input to that, uh, to that element before it's being sent to our Angular uh, template engine, then we can't inject anything, right? Because the template engine is only going to be looking at that limited scope. Uh, the other option is to use the ng non-bindable directive. This uh, attribute, if we add it to our HTML element, is going to tell the Angular expression engine, hey, don't render this. This is not part of the actual template. And the third option is to sanitize our untrusted input to remove curly braces. Again, because our HTML solutions aren't going to do this for us, it generally means we have to use some sort of uh, custom implemented uh, solution to remove those curly braces from our untrusted input. So as an example, if we log into our application with uh, invalid credentials, we see that they're reflected uh, back onto the page for us. So if we try a conventional uh, script alert one attack, we see that it's, it's unsuccessful. Uh, in this instance, it's actually being written to a text, uh, uh, text node, and it's not within an HTML uh, context. But if we inject our Angular expression one plus one, it renders to two. So we know we have in, uh, expression injection. So we're going to use a constructor.constructor .constructor, uh, to call alert. We'll inject that into our, our uh, insert that into our username field, submit it, and we see that we have successful cross-site scripting using Angular expression injection. So how do we fix this? Well, one option, again, is to limit the scope of the ng-app directive. If we go down here, this is where our untrusted input is actually being written uh, into our, our HTML. And this is where it's grabbing that untrusted input from the, uh, from the URI and inserting it into that, uh, that text node. So all we're going to do is, uh, in this paragraph element, we're going to insert the ng non-bindable directive. So again, we're telling the Angular expression engine, don't treat this as an Angular uh, template. Ignore it. So when we execute the same attack again, we see that instead of expression injection, our uh, untrusted input is uh, safely written to the page. Again, because we told the, the Angular uh, expression engine, ignore this part of the template. All right, next, local storage uh, information leakage. Again, dealing with Angular. So one of the things that HTML5 uh, gave us was additional storage options client side. Right? So instead of just storing stuff in cookies, we can now store stuff in local storage, storage uh, and session storage. 
So the key difference between the two is local storage persists indefinitely unless we explicitly clear it. Um, whereas session storage only persists as long as that browser session is active. So if we close our browser window, session storage is automatically cleared for us. From a security perspective, though, uh, that presents some problems. Uh, primarily because if we go to our, uh, if we log out or leave our application, close the window, and then open it back up, if we're storing data in local storage, we can go and inspect that local storage and see whatever data was there previously, whether it was from a previous user. Um, and if we're putting anything of sensitive nature in there, then that can potentially be exposed. So most Angular services use the less secure local storage by default. Uh, these are three common ones. Angular storage uses local storage by default. Angular Locker uses local storage by default. And ng storage, it actually doesn't define one or the other. So it's up to the developer to actually choose which one that they want to use. But none of these use the more secure session storage by default. You say, so what? I clear local storage on logout. Well, we can't necessarily rely on the user to programmatically log out of our application. If they just close that window, and we have sensitive data that's being stored in local storage, it's going to persist there indefinitely. So how do we fix this? Well, we need to ask ourselves, does the application really need to store sensitive data in web storage? If not, we shouldn't do it. Because remember, anything client-side is inherently untrusted. If we decide, yeah, we really do need to store this data client-side, then we need to configure the service to use session storage. Uh, this example uses the Angular storage module. And you can see we're going, uh, accessing the store provider set store uh, method and just changing that from local storage to session storage. So now the application will use uh, session storage rather than local storage. And even once we set this to use session storage, we still need to programmatically clear our session storage on logout, right? Because if a user logs out of the application and then navigates to some other page, does whatever, uh, whatever else, that data is still going to sit there in session storage if we didn't programmatically clear it on logout. So even though it's cleared once the window is closed, we still want to programmatically clear it. All right, continuing with Angular, uh, bypassing the strict contextual escaping service. So Angular provides the SCE service, which sanitizes malicious uh, or commonly abused HTML tags, attributes, protocols, and so forth. Um, so it's going to remove things like scripts, uh, script tags, on error attributes, on mouse over, uh, the JavaScript protocol, so forth and so on. So the strict contextual escaping service is a good thing, but it can be disabled. You can disable it per instance by calling the trust as HTML, trust as CSS, trust as URI, uh, or the shorter version, just trust as, and then specifying what you want to trust it as. So again, this is per uh, per instance of, of, of whatever this data is. We're saying trust this specific piece of data. It can also be disabled globally, and there's really no reason why you would ever do this in production, right? If we set the SCE provider uh, enabled to false, then we're telling, it, we're telling Angular, don't do any strict contextual escaping. And again, there's no, really, there's no reason why we'd want to do that uh, globally, for our, uh, globally across our whole application. So we'll look at an example, uh, again, with our mean bug application. If we query an invalid uh, invoice ID, we see that it's reflected back onto the page. So what we're going to do is insert this image tag where the source is X, which is going to uh, not evaluate anything, and where the uh, on error attribute is an alert message. But we see it didn't actually work, right? All we got was the empty image tag. So if we inspect this actual HTML element, then we see that all we have is image source equals x. Our on error alert uh, attribute has been stripped from, from that element. So if we go into our Angular application code, and you see we're using the uh, SCE service here, we're going to disable the SCE service globally. We're going to reload our Angular page. And then we're going to submit the same payload again. And this time when we submit it, the uh, cross-site scripting attack is successful. And if we look at the HTML, we see that 
we see that our on error attribute is still there, right? We've disabled our strict contextual escaping service and it's no longer sanitizing these uh, commonly abused attributes, scripts, and protocol, uh, script tags and protocols. So finally, Node.js. So Node.js is our, our uh, server-side JavaScript environment that lets us run this, uh, these, this technology stack. So with, with Node.js, uh, it requires root privileges to bind to any port lower than 1,000. So if we're uh, spinning up our, our application server on port 80, port 443, we've got to use uh, sudo to our root account or use uh, you know, an account with elevated privileges to do so, which is generally not a good idea, right? We generally don't want our web app server running as root because in the event of a compromise, our impact is going to be much higher, right? If, if a, an attacker can compromise uh, that account that we're running under, then they can do a lot more. So what we need to do is go ahead and use these elevated privileges to bind to these low uh, ports, and then once we start our server, once we do the binding, then drop down to a less privileged account using process set user ID and process set group ID. And then another quirk with, with Node.js is by default it runs in development mode. So Node.js has a node environmental or node env variable that lets us set the uh, the environment that we're running in. So by default, it runs in development mode. And if Express is running on top of Node.js, it looks at this node env variable to determine how it's going to react in, in certain uh, certain scenarios. Right? One of those being if it gets an uncaught error. So if Express encounters an uncaught error and it's running uh, on Node.js in development mode, then it returns that whole error back to the user. So that error can inc include things like file paths, stack traces, other sensitive information that we probably don't want to disclose. So how do we fix this? Well, when we run our uh, Node.js, we want to set the node env variable to something other than development. So we can set it to production, uh, really any, any string or any value other than development is going to uh, prevent this, right? So in this uh, solution, we've set the node env variable to production uh, on the command line when we start our uh, express server in our node environment. And you can see that now when we request a uh, resource that doesn't exist, instead of uh, passing the uncaught error back to the user, it simply returns a more benign not found. And that is a very quick walk through the mean stack and some common uh, mistakes and vulnerabilities that you may encounter. Uh, that's it for this talk. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Stuart. Sorry, questions? Uh, sorry if this is an obvious answer, but at the start when you were chatting about not using get to delete things and you switched to using post, yes. was the reason why you didn't use the delete verb for that? Um, so in that, in that situation, we weren't actually deleting a resource on the server. We were hitting an API that was then querying our database and removing that, uh, that invoice from the database. Yeah, but uh, you could still have used the HTTP delete verb on your REST API, though. Yeah, we so so we could use other uh, other verbs. They don't have to use the post method, right? Uh, the the point there was simply if we can avoid changing state with GET requests, right? Then we should do so because that's considered poor hygiene. Well, that's okay. right. I just wanted to check there wasn't some reason that I didn't know. No, no, no. And if if we were using delete, then the CSERF um, uh, middleware would be applied to it appropriately. We just want to avoid using Git for those state changing okay. uh, Good. Thank you. resources. Anyone else? Sorry. Any other questions? Okay, folks, well then that's it. Uh, if I could ask you again, just to remind you, please, if you would, put one of the tickets in on your way out, uh, just to 
as feedback for ourselves. And again, thanks very much, David. Thank you.